everybody hi tam hello and welcome to enchantment of attorneys a review for tin man which is episode 20 of season 3 of Star Trek The Next Generation. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review every single solitary episode of Star Trek The Next Generation one episode at a time. In this video, I cover the lovely episode of... I don't know why I'm talking like this. I cover the episode of Tin Man. So Tin Man is the episode in which Starfleet is sent a specialist to help in a mission, a mission to recover a sentient space ship that is near a uh, star about to go supernova and the Romulans claim it and the Federation's job is to get to him before the Romulans do. Uh, the specialist, however, is a bit of a uh, has a bit of a disability. He's a uh, Betazoid telepath who has telepathy turned up to a thousand where he gets everyone's thoughts and feelings everywhere around him immediately and he can't handle it and it causes him to be a bit of a curmudgeon and he clashes with the crew however he does befriend data and eventually it is deemed necessary to beam tam eldrum on board in order to save ten man and data goes with him however um Tam Eldrum decides that it's been his destiny to merge with Tin Man and become one because Tin Man is a ship, sentient ship that lost his crew and is searching for a new crew and uh, is giving Tam Eldrum's meaning, life meaning and so it beams Data back to the Enterprise and flings the Enterprise and uh, the Romulan ship away from the star before it goes Nova and then Tin Man goes off into the yonder with Tam Eldrum. So, I feel like I need to start by explaining that intro <laughs> because I'm sure the vast majority of you are like, what? what? What the hell are you talking about? So, in order to explain that, I need to talk about the guest star uh, that plays Tam Eldrum. Um, let me just look up his name here. Just uh, Harry Gron Groner? Yeah. Anyway, I watched a bunch of reviews, and also there's a Patreon comment that mentions that refers to him as a character from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Now, I have, and I have not, and never will watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, I call saw a couple episodes enough to see that I really would not like that show. I mean, really would not like that show. So, I never have, and I never will. Watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's on my firm list of shows that I ever, never, ever, ever will watch, which also includes Doctor Who. Sorry, Doctor Who fans, but it's not for me. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I can't think of any sh other shows. I know there's some movies on that list, like Fast and the Furious, Twilight, stuff like that. Never, ever is going to watch a single Fast and the Furious movie. Never going to happen. Anyway, <laughs> I'll watch the pitch meetings for it, sure. But, all right, now I'm getting off topic. Point is, I don't know that actor from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I know him from a little show called Dear John. This was a sitcom that aired in uh, the late 80s and early 90s that I used to watch obsessively. I used to love that show. Um, it was about a group of, um, like a support group, kind of like uh, AA or something like that, but it wasn't for alcoholics. In fact, they made a, they played the whole joke about that in the first episode. The group, was, a support group was for people who were recently divorced or separated in a significant relationship. Um, so they're coping with having someone left them important, hence the title Dear John, the cliche about a Dear John letter. In fact, the whole... Uh, show opens with the, the opening theme is like shows the main character's names John getting a Dear John letter and the whole have the song going Dear John anyway <laughs> I used to love that show so this actor was on that show and that's where I know him from he played this um, neurotic kind of he's a, like kind of a pathetic loser in fact the show just makes him more and more pathetic every episode and that's the joke 
Which I think eventually they did turn his character around and, and make him, you know, better and stop picking on him like that. But that's who that's where who this actor played. I think his character's name was Ralph. And uh, as soon as I saw this episode, I'm like, hey, it's the guy from Dear John. Now, um, to explain the intro more, the, as I said, it was a support group. And so every time someone... Uh, you know, introduced himself. You know, like the whole cliche with AA is like, my name is John, I'm an alcoholic. But here, they would say, oh, my name is John. And then the leader of the group would go, everybody! And then everyone together at the same time in the chorus would go, hi, John! <laughs> and that was sort of the the key of the show. And um, I actually just, because for this review, because it reminded me of Dear John, I hadn't seen that show in ages. I went back and watched a couple of episodes on YouTube, and it's actually not bad. It actually ages fairly well. Like, there's a lot of sh sitcoms from the 80s and 90s I used to love when I was younger that I try watching now, and like, ugh. They don't actually age very well. Like Night Court is a good example. I remember thinking it was hilarious, and I went back and watched, you know, some episodes I remember loving and being like, "Yeah, this is not that really that funny." But Dear John actually ages surprisingly well. Now, granted, it's still got the '80s sitcom cheese to it. It's still a bit ridiculous, and it has that like. Um, easy listening jazz saxophone in between transitions that's very um, sort of common with the 80s sitcoms which i find beyond cheesy <laughs> but it's actually not that half bad i might actually watch a few more episodes of dear john and also another actor who's from dear john is the guy who played kirk who's a sleazy sleaze bag and um he went on to play he was in breaking bad he played the um uh, not, you know, Tam Eldrin, but the Kirk from Dear John. Anyway, he played the um, therapist in Breaking Bad. He played uh, Jesse Pinkman's therapist when Jesse Pinkman was in recovery. Uh, it was such a different character for Kirk. It was like, took my brain like a few minutes to digest that it's the same actor. I've seen him in a few other things playing a sleazebag. But anywho, I don't think... Oh yeah, this actor... Um, what's his face again? <laughs> I just said his name. Um, Harry Gronin. He was in several other episodes of Star Trek as well, which is, I think, the only other thing I, I've seen him in. Um, oh, no, no, there was something very... He was in Oppenheimer, actually. I remember seeing he had a brief cameo in Oppenheimer. He was one of the judges. But anyway, he was in um, the Voyager episode, Sacred Ground, where he played like this the prime minister or something, and then of this stupid alien planet. And then he was in Enterprise and Terror Prime and Demons, where he played, like, the president of Earth or whatever. They, I can't remember what his title was. Maybe it was president? I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, so he seems to play politicians a lot. But anyway, <laughs> I thought he was damn good in this episode. I thought he was by far the highlight of this episode. I thought he put in a really, really good performance and was good in his role. And you know what? I've read a lot of comments, a lot, saying that this character was very annoying. And I can, I get it. I get, I totally get why people would find this character annoying. But I personally didn't. I, I just think he was... Um, I sort of empathized with him like I could like like I think the episode did a really really good job of explaining just how hectic and how mentally damaging having his condition would be and I think the actor does a lot of that is a credit to the actor who just does an amazing job in this role so I I have more sympathy rather than just finding him annoying but that's just me um, anywho, <laughs> that huge aside about Dear John aside, um, after I watched this episode on my recent rewatch just now, um, the first thought that came to mind was, I bet you anything this was a spec script, because it seems very out of step from the rest of season three, very different from the rest of season three now don't get me wrong like i don't think it breaks continuity or anything like i think all the characters for example are acting in character in fact you get strong character moments 
uh, for certain characters like Counselor Troy and Data. Um, and then it has stuff like the Romulan, so it connects to continuity in that way. So it's not that it, it breaks continuity. And Picard, whatever, he's also... Like, all the characters are in character. But what I mean that it feels like out of step... Because Season 3 is not a serialized arc. It's every episode's uh, very sort of standalone. But it's, it feels different. Like, it has a very different feel. To it. And some of that has to do with the music, which I'll talk about later, but I think overall it's just, I think the music definitely contributes to it, but I think it's the script itself. It's the story, it feels different, so that's why I almost immediately leave like, oh, this has got to be a spec script, because it feels so different. Because I, you know, I bet you anything it wasn't brought up by any of the normal, regular staff writers who write who write the majority of episodes. Even some of the spec scripts, their hands are all over, like, rewriting it or, like, shoring it up. And, and I get the sense, I like, I don't know that for sure, but I get the sense that this, this did get a rewrite from Melinda Snodgrass, but I have the, you know, the sense that it wasn't a heavy rewrite for, like, for example, episodes like The Offspring. The episode was almost practically written by her. It was a very heavy rewrite. where And she even cited that as one episode she's very proud of, even though she's not credited as the writer, because it's an uncredited rewrite, but she feels like she did a lot of good work on it. Whereas this episode, um, she didn't mention that. <laughs> and so I... Uh, so. This episode, okay, let me see if I can bring up, again, bring up the names. Um, I should have had this prepared. Sorry. Okay, so, do, 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 let's get this. So, it was written by um, Dennis Bailey, David Biscoff, uh, and there was also a third writer who didn't get credited for it because... Uh, legally, they could only have two written, two people having a written by credit, even though it was the three of them that wrote it. Um, from memory, I believe it was Lisa White or something along those lines. Sorry, I didn't have this prepared because I'm terrible at preparing. But anyway, <laughs> um, anyway, so well, Dennis Bailey and David Biscoff. Um, or novelist. So this episode, Tin Man, is based off of a short story um, called, uh, what was it? Tin Wooden Man. So sort of similar. Uh, and that short story was turned into a novel by Dennis Bailey and, and David Biscoff. And so they decided to, they've heard people say that their novel was very Star Trek like. So they decided, hey, let's turn it into a Star Trek episode. So, um, so it was a um, sort of a spec script, an unsolicited uh, script that was picked up in season three, as many uh, season three scripts were. Um, and this was the first uh, script that they wrote for television. So, um, yeah, and as I said, I get the feeling that it wasn't heavily rewritten. It was probably just, they probably just added some of the characterizations with, like, Troy and Data and Picard and making them feel more like the characters. And it's funny because the actually the writers of this um, script said that they decided to write this script in response to the second season episode, Samaritan Snare, because they thought that episode was terrible. <laughs> and they were like, oh my god, what a terrible script. I could do better, so they thought they could do better, and so they wrote this script. Which, you know, to be fair to them, this is definitely a better episode than Samaritan Snare. I didn't think that episode was that terrible, and I would pinpoint a lot more episodes in Season 2, which I would think would be much worse. But... Yeah, I think they're right. This is a better episode than that one, which isn't very hard to do. It's not a it's not a high bar to clear, as they say. But anyway, so the idea of this script 
was that they wanted a bottle show. Which I, that's funny because I never thought of this as a bottle show because you have the special effects of Tin Man, you have the special effects of the Romulan ship, you have to go to the interior of Tin Man. But what I read, Michael Piller considered this a bottle show. And I'm like, okay. So apparently, what the deal was is that they were so busy writing um, all the other episodes. Um, that all the other writers had their hands full writing the following episodes, which I'm looking at the episode list here. There's uh, Hollow Pursuits, uh, The Most Toys, Sarek, and Menage of Troy come after this one. And, you know, Transfigurations and then Best of Both Worlds after that, but I don't know if they would have gotten that far at this stage. Uh, and they might have still been working on some of the previous episodes, like Allegiance or Captain's Holiday. Uh... But the point is, whatever the case may be, everyone else is too busy working on other episodes, but they had this slot that they needed to fill. So um, they're like, just find a spec script that's a, that's a bottle episode that looks like it can be shot all, practically almost immediately. And uh, <laughs> and so they went through the, you know, the slush pile, and they found this script and said, here, let's just do this. And so, as I said, I get, that's why I get the sense that Melinda Snodgrass just did a very quick once-over. Michael Piller probably just did a very quick once-over. And I think by their own admissions, they didn't change it that much. It's unlike, you know, has other scripts like The Offspring, which was heavily rewritten. Um, this one, I think they barely touched it, just added their own touches to it. And they were, like, sent it to get to be filmed like almost immediately like they did like within a week they're like yeah yeah, yeah here's the script that's fine Psh, and send it off which is the whole point because they wanted something that they could shoot immediately that wouldn't be too expensive and so that they could spend more time working on all these other scripts because they were so has i talked about a lot of these other season three videos they were so far behind so hectic and maybe that was just it maybe it wasn't the particular episodes that made them have the handfuls, maybe just because this was late in season three, they had gotten too far behind and they were getting overwhelmed and they're like, ah, oh, we can't deal with this. Let's just, uh, we don't have time to write the script, so let's just grab something, do a very quick rewrite, and send it all for shooting. And that was this episode. And um, apparently Rick Berman was the one who halted the script for a week. Otherwise, they were like, yeah, 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 let's just send it off. <laughs> but he was like, wait, wait, wait a second. And he put it, like some of his red tape on it. And so they had to, like, oh, fine, whatever. And it wouldn't satisfy Rick Berman. <laughs> and then it went, went straight to shooting. Um, and as I said, I like... Before I knew all this, like, this is stuff I researched and looked up, and most of it I just found out now or today. And even before I, you know, researched this and found this out, as I said, it was obvious from watching it that this was um, written by different writers than what the noble TNG writers uh, even yeah, as I said, even some of the other spec scripts or the or scripts from you know freelance writers because sometimes they'll just bring in freelance writers who who are just who are not on staff but they'll work occasionally as you know every once in a while and they'll write a script and even those though like don't feel out of place because the they're heavily rewritten or like you know giving passes by you know michael puller or whatever and making sure that it connects with the rest of the show and for me it made sense that this one wasn't really that heavily rewritten or or that heavily taken care of that it was just something different and it's written based off a short story also makes a lot of sense because the idea of this story existed outside of star trek and they just converted it to star trek next generation and that would to me also contribute to why it feels so out of place and so unlike the rest of season three and as i said let me make it very clear that's not like oh i found out all this information about oh this script was based off a short story and it was written by the spec scripts and it was rushed to production and wasn't heavily rewritten and then decided oh well based off of that information i think that this story feels out of place no i had come to the conclusion that the story feels out of place and very unseasoned three like 
before I found any of this stuff out. This stuff just makes it all make sense. It made, I was like, oh, this that makes so much sense. Now, that being said, I don't dislike this episode. In fact, I do actually like this episode quite a bit, uh, to be fair. Uh, to be clear, I should say. Um, but I just note that it always, like always, not just recently, even you know, decades ago when I was a teenager, it always felt a bit different. And as I said, the music contributes to that. So this was, uh, the score was done by Jay Chataway, and this is the first score he ever did for Next Gen. Uh, he would go on to become a regular composer from in Star Trek from Next Gen DS9 Voyager. I think Enterprise too. He would st he would stick with the show with Dennis McCarthy for like the long haul, uh, and he, yeah, him and Dennis McCarthy would be the main composers after Ron Jones quit, uh, which is next season, season four. Um, but this was his first score, and it's a very. It's, I put it in my top ten favorite score, or no, it wasn't my top ten. It was an honorable mention, so it was more like top twenty <laughs> of my favorite scores of Next Generation. Uh, because it is a very unique score. It uses a lot of flute. And as I said, this really can also contributes to it feeling differently. Because the score is very noticeably different from the, all the rest of the scores of Season 3. So it feels out of place in that way as well. In that regard. And also, like, this is Jay Chataway being very unique. Having a very unique, organic sound that goes along with Tin Man. Whereas... Going forward, Jake Chataway is, I think, rightfully or wrongfully criticized for having very generic background music. Um, and I, I talked about this in other music videos that I think that's more the fault of the producers and Rick Berman who would get on. In fact, that's why Ron Jones quit because he was sick of dealing with it. But Dennis McCarthy and Jake Chataway stuck it out, but they had to tone down their music and make it more generic because that's what the producers of Star Trek were pushing for. And I honestly, as I said, I'm a huge fan of Dennis McCarthy, so I think he actually did a better job of getting away with making his music, it's like slipping in uniqueness and making it not be just wallpaper music and, and, and having all these subtle, you know, touches that slip by the producers whereas i think jay chataway wasn't as good at doing that and his most a lot of his scores were very generic but again i don't blame him for that i blame blame the producers uh but he because especially listening to this score which is very unique you can see what he what he's capable of and what he can do and by the way jay chataway uh, did the music for the inner light, <laughs> which again, that's another outstanding piece that shows that what he's capable of. And if you ever heard that, even though it wasn't on the episode, there was this um, orchestral piece that was on like an album. You can look it up on YouTube of the inner light music. It's fucking beautiful. So he's an, definitely an amazing com composer. It's just the producers kind of they wouldn't let him do as good as he could <laughs> but anyway this is an example of what he did because this was a really good score but it also feels um extremely out of place um and i want to talk about the romulans because it's been criticized that the romulans come off as generic bad guys in this episode and i'm not going to argue with that i think that's absolutely a valid point but it doesn't bother me because they're not the point of the plot. The point of they're just there to create tension. Now I've heard it argued like you could cut out the Romulans entirely and not lose anything, which I disagree. I think they definitely you definitely now I'm one who always complains about having a threat of the week for the sake of it. Sometimes I think a lot of these episodes of Star Trek would be better off if there was no threat of the week and they just did a character piece. This is not one of them. I think you need the threat of the week in this episode. And uh, I think if you remove it, then you lose some of the urgency, which I think is does a really good job of driving the character stories. Like, I think without that urgency, the character stories would not, especially Tam's character story of wanting to bond with Tin Man, that would not be as powerful 
if there was no threat, if there was no urgency. So I think you absolutely need the threat. You absolutely need the urgency, and you don't need to focus on it. <laughs> like you, it, Because it's not the point of the episode, even though you do need it, it, because it drives the character story, but the character story is the point of the episode. So you, even though you need it, you don't need to focus on it. Uh, and as far as it being the Romulans... If it wasn't the Romulans, it would be generic alien that they just made, one-off alien that they made up for this episode. And since the alien is inconsequential, I would much rather they use an established alien than just make off of a one-off alien. Oh, this is the Trotations or the Tim Lobbians, and you never see them ever again. Like, that would be stupid. <laughs> I much If you're going to have a generic bad guy, use one that's already established. And I've heard people complaining, oh, these, the Romulans should have been more and they should have had more characters. They should have had Tom Locke and everything. Tom Locke would have been wasted in this episode because they're not the fucking point of the episode. The fucking point of the episode is Tin Man and Tam Elbrum. And so you don't need to explore the Romulans more. But I still think it's much better to have an established bad guy than just make one up. Because I think the one-off alien thing is bullshit. I think, I think, again, it brings more continuity to the show as a whole to have, oh, the, we're at conflict with the Romulans, and the Romulans are the bad guys in this conflict. Makes perfect sense. Um, also, I've heard other people complain that the Romulans are acting out of character in this episode, and that's another thing I disagree with. Um, and I've also heard, getting back to the music, I heard people complain that the music was over the top when it showed the Romulan ship, like, attack the Enterprise, and went, da 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 -da -da! And someone's like, God, that music is like, needs to calm the fuck down. <laughs> There's something that's really like hyping it up. I disagree. I actually love that. Uh, to me, that without that music, that drives the sense of urgency that you need for this episode. So I completely disagree. I, the music is one thing I think is perfect in this episode. Perfect. Like if you listen to, if you listen to. It's the piece, it's the sample I chose for my extended version of my top 10 soundtracks when I talked about this episode. When Picard is talking to Tam Eldrum in Sick Bay about Tin Man and how Tam Eldrum's saying, you know, he's in connection with Tin Man and that Tin Man is, is you know, wants to die. Um, just. Watch that scene and ignore what Picard... Ignore the dialogue. Just think of the dialogue as, like, background noise and listen to the music. The music is fucking amazing. <laughs> that scene is just so good. It is just so good. And, then of course, that towards the end when they do the flute music, when they're on Tin Man, was also just, it was just so good. But anyway, I already talked about the music. I got back on that topic for some reason. Anyway, <coughs> um... Let's talk about Tam Eldrum himself. Um, I think the thing with Riker being pissy with him uh, for, you know, the prior incident, that was a nice touch. I've heard other people complain, oh, they never followed up on it. They don't need to. It's not the point of the goddamn episode. It's just there for background meat for you know to flesh out the episode to make it feel more established and i think it serves its purpose 100 percent in that regard it it's it adds so much to it to have Riker, a character that we care about that we know hate this man and think that this man is responsible for deaths well at the same time you have troy also a character we know and love really sympathize with this person and have a prior relationship with them and 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 so it does the job like i think it's really brilliantly written that way because it does the job of fleshing out this character and making him not a simple good or not a simple bad guy he's a complex guy who definitely has a mental disability that's i think that's very clear the analogy they're going for and i think they do a fucking damn good job and as i said a lot of that has to do with the actor as well who really plays this very well and then you also add data into the mix where he has he has this unique relationship with data where he really connects with data because 
Data is not bombarding him with his thoughts and emotions like every other humanoid being is. He has to put up with all these humanoids. And in fact, I like how they point out things, how he purposely went on a mission with, uh, you know, uh, they implied that the species was not humanoid, that apparently they have like a 21 day ritual in order to say hello. <laughs> and he describes their minds as glacial. So they, so it's clear that these, this, this alien is sentient, but very, very different, like non-humanoid and very sort of slow and not constantly bombarding him with thoughts the way humanoids would be. And so, again, that's another interesting sort of background to this character and how he has to cope and how being on the Enterprise, you know, being bombarded by the thoughts and feelings of a thousand people is too much for him. And I think, again, the way this actor plays this, where he would constantly tell other people what they're going to say before they say it. Like <laughs> when Picard like gives data, this look is goes to data. And he's like, Oh, you better get that information up to the bridge. Picard wants you to study it and, and get back with an analysis. Isn't that right? <laughs> and Picard's just like, Ugh. and that, but my favorite scene on that regard was when they were in the ready room and um, Picard uh, chastises him for not mentioning the Romulans. And he's like, I know, I know, I was distracted. And then you see, and again, this is such a good performance, Jonathan Frakes. He does this. It's like he's sit talking, but he's not actually talking. Like, he gives this perfect look where you can even, I don't even have to be an empath or a telepath to know that he's thinking, oh, yeah, were you distracted on Garushta? <laughs> and, but you don't hear that. He doesn't say anything. He just has that look of, blah, blah. and then Tam reacts to him and has an argument as a one-sided argument from an outsider's perspective because he's the only one who's talking. Riker does not say a single word, and yet he has an argument with them. It's like, no, well, I don't care what you believe, and walks out. That was brilliant. Like, I think that's really good writing. Um, so overall, like, I, I'm sorry. I didn't find Tam <laughs> annoying. I don't know why, for whatever reason. I just thought he was a brilliant, uh, probably much better than what Star Trek does in a lot of other cases, such as uh, freaking uh, Melora. Or um, trying to think of another case where where they really mishandled this. Oh, the loss! God damn it! Don't even get me started about the loss. Where they really mishandle um, disabilities. This is a an example of where they're handling it very well. Where they actually do a very good job at it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I gotta talk about. So when Tam Meldrum leaves to go to, t to with Tin Man. I think that was the perfect ending for the episode. I think it was a touching ending, in fact. I think it made... Maybe I liked it better than most people because I liked the character of Tam better than most people. Maybe because, maybe because most people hated this character or thought he was annoying. They didn't really connect with him where I did. I connected with him, and so I, I think like the moment when he was talking to Picard and Sickbane, he was saying he's feeling loneliness, empty pain. Like, you really get the sense that he's connected with Tin Man. And the other thing is, is I totally bought Tin Man as a sentient ship, which I, I heard, heard, just listened to a review where they said they didn't buy it at all. I totally did. I'm not sure why. They used a really interesting sound effect, which apparently, and I heard this like decades ago, I heard this a long time ago, but apparently the sound editing people, and this is something I really appreciate having worked on sound editing on, you know, nonsense short films that nobody's seen, <laughs> but um, uh, the sound editors got the sound from that Tin Man makes from recording, um, like, putting a stethoscope on their stomach and recording their stomach digesting a pizza. <laughs> And I think they, like, slowed it down and, like, tweaked it a bit to make it sound weird. And so it doesn't sound like, you know, you wouldn't think that's what it is, but that's what it is. And it makes it really organic. It sounds almost whale-like, really. I would have thought it was, like, whales if I were to guess, but no, apparently it's digestion. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it, yeah, it makes it, gives Ten Men a very organic feel. And just the way... That again, the actor who plays Sam Eldrum does a damn good job, and just the way that he interacts with Tin Man and the way he speaks about him really did make Tin Man feel like a character. It wasn't just 
a ship. It wasn't just uh, this, you know, special effect pine cone thing. <laughs> it w- it felt like a character. It felt like, and even though a lot of what Tin Man was feeling was interpreted through Tam, he still Tin Man still felt like his own character, and I think that was a huge accomplishment uh, as well. Now then, we get to the ending. Oh, I have to talk about one minor complaint I have first before I get to the ending, and that's um, I disagree with Data. So Tam wants to beam over to Tin Man, and Picard's like, no, that's not a good idea. And, oh, they have that line, which I love, where Tam's like, you don't trust me, do you? And, and Picard is just, I love Picard's response. It's, like, so good. He's like, no, Tam, I don't believe that I do. Because he's frank. He just doesn't he cuts the bullshit he just gets straight to the point like he doesn't like no i do trust you but it's just that blah 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 he's like flat out no i don't think i do trust you (laughs) and here's why and i thought that was fucking brilliant but anyway so picard um doesn't want tam to go but then when data's alone with him data sort of you know advocates for him saying well sir this is our mission why are we not going to complete our mission like this is the whole point of us coming here is to get Tim Man out of danger and Tam's the only one that can do it so why would we not and then Data further suggests that he go with Tam in order to act as a bridge back to the Enterprise and this is where I disagree with Data like I agreed with this first thing that first part of what Data said about well, we need to finish this mission, so why would you not send them over? But I disagree that Data should be the one to go with him. And Picard even suggests, well, what about Counselor Troy? She knows him better, and Data's like, well, no, he's more comfortable around me, and I can serve as the bridge back. But here's the thing. I think Troy would actually do a better job of serving as a bridge back to Starfleet and the Federation because... Because of the fact that he can read Troy. That because with Data, he can't read Data. So as far as his telepathy is concerned, it's just him and Tin Man. And no one else is there and they're blocked out. So when Data talks, his voice... I could just imagine from Tam's perspective, it would sound like it's a million miles away. Or like spoken through a muscle. It's like it's so insignificant because he's bombarded by the feelings of everything from Tin Man and so if they actually had an organic being like Troy especially someone with such a close connection and someone who actually does care about him like Troy he would have that even though it would still be minor compared to Tin Man because I'm sure being on the ship with inside Tin Man it's overwhelming but it would still exist it would still be a voice in his ear like not just her talking but her whole you know all of her thoughts and emotions and feelings he would still be getting it like up here even though it would, it would be underwhelming compared to Tin Man it would still be there therefore it would be like a voice in his ear being like no you shouldn't do this you should actually come back to the Enterprise we you still need to care about us uh, so I think she would have been a much better choice than Data uh, because Data, as I said, it's because he can't sense, even though he likes Data, he can't sense anything from him, so he, he's a lot easier to dismiss, like, whatever, bullshit. Whereas Troy would have been harder to dismiss. That's my thought. But I, get, I think the reason why it was Data instead of Troy is for plot con- convenience, because Troy would never stand for... Um, him staying behind she would argue she would yell with him she wouldn't stand for it and um granted they could you know tin man could just beam her on the enterprise and be like well who cares what you say and fuck off but that would have a different connotation though it would be more sort of an upsetting parting it would be more sort of not such a you know peaceful lovely ending for tam he would end by being in the middle of an argument with Troy, which isn't the best way to to end the friendship. So I see why the plot chose Data, because that's a better ending to have, you know, Data simply 
be being back to the ship rather than someone arguing where, you know, Data just goes, Tim, blah, 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 and he's easier to dismiss or whatever. That's actually a better ending than having Troy in a straight out argument with him, which she would be because she would not be okay with him staying behind. So I get it for the plot, but really it's contrivance because it doesn't actually it's not the good plan like picard made the wrong decision by having data go over there and i think picard's better than that i think picard would know better than to send troy and that troy should have objected as well that troy you know because when um picard told tam and data to beam over troy was about to object and picard like silenced her and then once he was finished talking he's like where we no longer have a choice because the Romulans are about to, you know, attack 10 men or whatever, which again is why you need that threat there, by the way. You need it. But anyway, um, that's when Troy should have been like, well, and have me beam over, not Data, or have me go with Data because why do you need a two person away team? Why shouldn't, couldn't she have gone with them? But again, the answer is plot contrivance. So I do have to hold that against the episode. But anyway, it has a very beautiful, lovely ending where after Data, after this whole situation is resolved and Data's being back to the Enterprise, he requests Troy and he's in the uh, conference lounge just looking out at the stars and he tells Troy about, um, he wanted to, you know, he wanted to convey that Tam wanted her to know that he's at peace and that he's happy now and wanted her to know that and um also when he said um that when tin man beamed it back to the enterprise he realized that that's where he belonged tan belonged with tin man but data belonged on the enterprise and that i think is the closest to again i love this portrayal of data where they show him has almost portraying emotions without portraying emotions like this is what i love i've heard other people complain about and say oh he's a non-feeling robot that's not an interesting a non-feeling robot is not an uninteresting character and it's not who data is data is a humanoid android and he does he's a lot more complex and his complexity makes sense for a non-feeling android but it borderlines human behavior sometimes and i think that's when he's most interesting i think that's how i would describe his character overall and i think people who some writers don't write correctly for him and some audience like that misinterpretation of data better i don't <laughs> I, I like this interpretation of data better where he has this almost human-like epiphany where he says this is where i belong and um then troy hugs him and sort of leans on his shoulder and stares out into space with them and says you're right data this is where you belong i'm almost tearing up just talking about it It was such a beautiful moment it was such a great moment between these two characters and it had me thinking after just watching this episode today that maybe they should have done a data and troy relationship now hear me out <laughs> i think th it's not just this episode but other episodes where data i think data's day is another example when he's talking to troy and he says i believe i have the, a lot to offer a prospective mate and troy's like data i think you you're right you do have a lot to offer and, and stuff like that but they never played off of that and i'm really disappointed that's one thing star trek failed to do is to get data in a meaningful relationship um because that episode the end theory episode was terrible and i'll talk about that when i when i get there but it was a bad example and i think if they would have played a troy and data in a long-term relationship that could have been something beautiful like actually having it would have been an amazing contrast uh, emotional empath who feels emotions who is all job is all about emotions being in a relationship with a non-feeling android <laughs> like i think that they could have played something beautiful there uh and honestly i think that would have worked a billion times better than the whole wharf troy thing i think that whole thing was bullshit i know some people think it worked in some episodes like ethics and parallels but parallels kind of did but that's a parallel universe so who cares uh, but no i disagree i think that never worked i think it was a stupid idea and they never should have done it i think troy and data would have been much better that being said she definitely did deserve to end up with Riker at the end so i would stand by that 
But I don't know. Maybe not a full on romantic relationship, but maybe if they played off Data and Troy. No, I think a romantic relationship would have been good. I think it's a missed opportunity for TNG. But anyway, <laughs> that's just my opinion. Anyway, I would like to thank all those that support me on Patreon. It's very much appreciated. Uh, helps me continue with my channel. It's, uh, yeah. I'm very humble, very thankful for everyone's support. So I'll just give a quick shout out to uh, Antarius, uh, Tetzin, Greg Marley, Francisco Chuck Hooks, Kyrie091, Anthony D. Benedictus, Ricky, Manny Jester, Joel Valls, um, Alessandro Miguelisio, Norman Buckwald, Stephen Kennedy, Britton Berg, Allison Fordyce, and Brandon Neal House. Thank you all so very much for your support so uh we have a few patreon comments well quite a lot actually but we have a couple patreon comments for this episode first comment is from kairi 91 who says tin man more like thin plan am i right okay that's gotta be my worst pun yet but these titles aren't forgiving let me make this work stay with me here you see their plan to outsmart the Romulans in this episode wasn't a very robust plan. Therefore, it was a thin plan. Man, I badly need us to get to an episode with a pun-worthy title. I miss weak performance and shades of nay when things were easier. And by the way, I added that am I right into that. He didn't actually write that in the comment because I think if, if I think it was appropriate. <laughs> I think it worked. Anyway, next comment is from Stephen Kennedy, who says, uh, The mayor of Sunnydale comes to the Enterprise to look for Principal Snyder, Armin Shimmerman. Oops, wrong show. Another good episode, but again, nothing special. It would have been brilliant if Kai Logic used the reference of the movie The Wizard of Oz regarding the title Tin Man or Kyrie 091 is who, who he's referring to. Uh, my rating is six times say there's no place like home out of ten. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, well, there you go. There's giving you ideas <laughs> for puns. Um, but just to, just to so you all know, Kyrie 091 responded to that comment saying, on Ha ha ha, unfortunately, I'm not particularly clever with my silly puns. Your idea is way cooler than mine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah that's, that's, that would be a nice tunnel. And by the way, it's not, it's not uh, the mayor of Sunnydale. It's Ralph from Dear John. <laughs> he comes on the bridge and everyone goes, Everybody, hi, Tam. Anyway, sorry. It's Dear John. Never going to watch Buffy. Anyway, <laughs> next comment is from Greg Marley, who says, This is a surprisingly good episode with a guest star who brings a lot of pathos to the role and sells me that it's all real and matters and that the alien creature is worthy of our attention and concern. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, next comment is from Norman Buckhold. He says, if I went by the last few minutes where Data gets submitted from uh, Gantu to the Enterprise and he surmises what had just happened with Tam and Gantu, etc. And the way Troy says with amazement he gets it and embraces him, this would be a true magic of what TNG is about and would be a 10 out of 10. Unfortunately, Tam is so annoying and unlikable, this provides a damper, especially since his only association with the TNG crew truly is him being a former patient of Troy. That could have been a start, and no, Troy and he shouldn't be former lovers, but something needed to be done further to make it also Troy's story if Tam is going to be the way he is. Then there's the Romulans as villains and as the first part of the threat of the week. Uh, why would they be interested in this species? I mean, really, and outside of Picard Season 1 with their issue of synthetic beings, this is the only time, really, I recall they even have an issue with, uh, 
when they see a species as a threat, which especially in the time of TNG makes no sense. We do not even get popular villain Tomalak for the R Trouble. There are still uh, neat parts such as Riker being told he is on a cruise ship from his colleague from the other ship and I did like Riker's issue with Tam which we will also see later with Ro Laren which adds a nice little touch of importance of safety for the crew and people not remembering the mission Star and Starfleet with him. But other than all that, Gum 2 is somewhat nicely mysterious and lonely, a perfect Trekkian type of touch for non-humanoid species. Uh, but we do not know much more about him except revealed by annoying Tam. Because of all this, I reluctantly cannot give more than a 7 out of 10. It's above average, especially for the last few minutes. I mentioned but otherwise had problems we'll get to that again when we discuss transfigurations that has some other issues in spite of an inspiring ending and then uh, Norman Buckwald uh, follows up with another comment saying one other comment Tam is another example of an attempt through a guest character to demonstrate disability in Trek, but like M Melora or even Troy herself in The Loss, it fails in providing a mainstream audience to have sympathy when they do not care or even understand the behavior. Which, as I mentioned before, kind of the opposite. <laughs> I disagree. I actually think this stands out better than those examples, but that is just me. Um... And also, yeah, there's also other notes, notes in Norman uh, Buckwald uh, statement, which I've already preemptively disagreed with, but that's okay. Uh, we don't always have to agree with everything. That would be boring. But anyway, um, I'm trying to think. There is something else he mentioned I wanted to touch on. Um, let's see. Um, Data is come to, um, why would they be interested? Oh, the Romulans. To me, it makes perfect sense that they would be interested in um, Tin Man because it's an advanced technology species that, of course, they would want it, and if they can't have it, they're not going to let the Federation have it. So that alone makes sense. Like, leaving aside Picard Season 1, which I would love to leave aside Picard... <laughs> Because who cares about that crap? But no, uh, to me, it just makes perfect sense. Advanced technology that they want for themselves, and if they can't have it, they're going to make sure the Starfleet doesn't have it. Plain and simple. I think that works. But that's just me. That is just me. Anyway, um, next comment is from a Brandon Neil Howells, who says, Watching this episode again reminded me of Farscape and encounter at far point i find tam of a very difficult character to like but i'm sure he would get on well with the protagonist of the next episode in this season referring to barkley if tam appeared in deep space nine he would be one of the mutants in statistical probabilities i do enjoy the rapport between data and tam however and what the hell is it with those horrible plated trouser that tam wears <laughs> is it it is almost as bad as picard's shirt and captain's holiday four reuse viger effects out of ten now, come on now. Let's not get crazy here. I didn't even notice Tam's trousers. But then again, I never noticed costuming as much as you do, Brandon. But saying that it's almost as bad as Picard. Now, that Picard shirt in Captain's Holiday, that I did notice. That was terrible. So I think it's, you're getting a bit overboard by saying it was just as bad as that. Anyway. Um... I guess I'll, I'll also mention Norman Buckwell's response to Brandon's comment, uh, where he says, If, like the mutants, Tam would also be sleeping in the cargo bay, although even in the DS9 universe, Odo did eventually migrate from his pl uh, pail to his own quarters, and it never made sense the genetically modified people had no traditional quarters. Why Seven and the Boar kids had to be where they were 
uh, was that they were Borg and they were put into alcoves, but otherwise that didn't make much sense either. Of course, the Doctor didn't have to just call sickbay home either. Wood Maddox had an issue. Um, Wood Maddox had an had issued data had an issue with data uh, having quarters. Sorry for the big aside. Maybe this should be a future essay topic on this oddity. Hint, hint. Oh no, don't hint at me, please. <laughs> got too much going on but anyway <laughs> but anyway yes i mean that could be something interesting possibly to explore of why i don't know to me the borg sleeping in the cargo bay makes sense uh odo sleeping in the pail but then moving to the quarters makes sense the, um but um so i don't think tan would have been crammed in the cargo bay that would make no sense but um as far as uh the uh, genetically engineered mutants put in the cargo bay that made no sense that i totally agree with so i don't know i wouldn't really have that much to say on this topic hint hint <laughs> anyway sorry oh anyway <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, patrons, for your comments. So my rating for Tin Man out of 10 is going to be an 8. Extremely good. Um, from how positively I was talking about this episode, that, sh that rating should come as no surprise. In fact, I, some people might have even thought I would give this a 9, although I, it didn't reach 9-ness to me. It wasn't that great of an episode, I think. The fact that it feels a bit weird and out of place does throw me off a bit. Like, it doesn't fit into the rest of Season 3. It does. It kind of does prevent me from really, really loving this episode and calling it one of the best of Season 3. And you had that plot hole at the end with them sending Data over for plot contrivance when really it would have made way more sense to send Troy. Even if you'd send Data and Troy, that would have made probably the most sense, actually. But anyway, um, yeah, overall, I love the character of Tam. I love the way to develop this character. I love the music in this episode. And I love, love, love that scene with Data and Troy at the end. I think that was a very touching scene. Almost teared me up. So, yeah, 8 out of 10. Um, extremely good. Anyway, that is it for my review of... Tin Man, which I actually want to say, I want to quote Armus where he goes, Very good, Tin Man. Anyway, sorry, I forgot to do that, so I had to throw that in. Anyway, let me check my schedule um, to see what's coming up next on my channel. So uh, tomorrow, next Thursday, or this Thursday, will be uh, the aforementioned next episode with a Broccoli, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Barkley. Hollow Pursuits, um, and then Saturday I'll be over on Patreon for my Patreon supporters for another revisited video for uh, my revisited for the most toys. And then on a Monday, continuing my monthly series of counting down my top 10 favorite episode scores or episode soundtracks this time covering deep space nine so my top 10 favorite deep space nine episode soundtracks will be coming this monday so that's what's coming and that of course will be live on my youtube channel anyway so that's what's coming up on my channel so be sure to uh check it out for all that and check out my channel for many more reviews on star trek and many other shows so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that and thanks a lot for watching.